Okay, the YouTube live stream should be on now. So we'll just welcome everybody to Shir Hashirim class number 15. Pretty exciting. And let me make sure the sound is off on the live stream. Okay, the YouTube. So they don't, we don't get feedback. Okay. And any questions before we start? Okay, on anything from the past lessons, okay, we'll give a, a brief summary going forward, which is in the last class, what we covered was when God comes to Egypt to bring the Jews out, and I'll share my documents so we can briefly peruse those, uh, those verses. Oh, Cliff, thank you for sending me your attendance. Thank you for the reminder. Everyone should please type into a private message or into the public chat your name. I have all your emails. So just so I remember later who was present and I can record it for the colo. Um, what else did I want to say? Yeah, the class is dedicated to, in memory of my father, by default, any learning that I do. Any mitzvah that I do, anything that I do is all to the credit and merit of my dearly departed father. I should uh, rest in peace. And uh, as they say, Allah shalom, I will dedicate this learning to his memory. And let me share my screen. Bear with me. Okay, now you can see the usual rainbow colors, right? Who joined us? Oh, welcome, Marilyn. So we, we, we spoke last time, the last couple of classes, about how God came to Egypt to bring the Jews out. And he says, arise, my beloved, my beautiful one, and go, lechilach, like the way that God says to Avraham, to Abraham, lech lecha, go for you. He says, lechilach go for you in the feminine and the winter has passed and the weather's beautiful. There's no more rain, the flowers, the musical sounds, the, the birds and the fruits and the smells, all the beautiful things of spring. And we explain all that stuff. So what was it? Essentially it's the Jews finally emerging from the Egyptian exile that was ultimately 210 years long plus the 190 years beginning with the birth of Yitzchak, Isaac, as we spoke about. And so now they're emerging from Egypt and we come to the next exciting event in that progression, which if you had to guess what it was, what would you say? I might've spoiled it last week. They come to now the Red Sea. So let's see. I spoiled it already, but let's let's read how it's expressed in the Shira Shirim. Yonosi Bihagve Hasela Besaiser Hamadrega Harini es Maraich Hashmini es Kolech Ki Kolech Arev Umar Eich Nove. Which means Yonosi. My Yonah, my dove, here is God speaking to Israel and describing her as my dove. Bechagve hasela, she is in the cracks, the crevices of the sela. A sela is like a type of like a large rock, okay, like a big rock, like a boulder. She's in the cracks of the rock. Beseser hamadriga. Seser, seter means something secret or hidden. She's in the hidden places, the hidden parts of the madrega. And madrega usually means a, a step. Uh, here it refers to kind of an, an arrangement of rocks that are piled in such a way that one could like climb over them, step over them. The, the, my dove is in the crevices of these rocks. 
He says, Harini esmar ayich. Show me your appearance. Hashmi'ini eskolech. Let me hear your voice. Ki kolech arev. For your voice is sweet. Umar ech nave. And your appearance is beautiful. Again, my dove in the crevices of the rock, in the hidden places of the rocks. Show me your appearance. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your appearance is beautiful. What's going on over here? Any thoughts before we dive into the commentary? Okay. So here we go. Yonasi b'chagvei hasela. My dove in the crevices of the rock. This was said regarding that time when Pharaoh chased after them. And he caught them in camping at the sea. There's nowhere to escape ahead of them because the sea is blocking the way. Panos, nor is there anywhere to turn. Lehipanos to turn. Mipenechayos Raos, because of the dangerous creatures that lived in the desert, meaning you had the sea in front of them, you had the, the chariots of Pharaoh, the army of Pharaoh behind them, and even they couldn't even escape sideways because there had amassed, there had gathered groups of ferocious, deadly desert creatures, snakes, scorpions, etc., to block their path. There was nowhere for them to go. Lama hayu domin ba'osasha. To what were they similar at that time? Leona sheborachas mi penehanets. She was like a dove that was running away from a nates. A nates is a hawk. The dove is running from the hawk. Well, flying, right? Is attempting to escape. Fleeing is the best translation. The, the dove is fleeing from the hawk. And she enters into the cracks between the rocks, the, cre the crevices between the rocks where the hawk cannot enter, cannot penetrate. So she's safe there, isn't she? But in the cracks of the rocks was a hissing snake. And the snake, she, she, she ducks into the crack and she's like, <laughs> you know, looking behind her, oh, that, that hawk, he can't get in, I'm safe. She turns into the crack and, and suddenly she hears the hissing snake coming towards her slithering towards her, the deadly snake that's going to devour her. Oh my goodness, outside, there's a hawk that's going to devour me. Inside, there's a snake that's going to devour me. What should she do? Tikone slifnim. Should she enter deeper into the rock? But the snake is there. Should she go out of the crack? But the hawk is there. Amar la Kaddish Baruch Hu, said the Holy One, blessed is he to her, to the dove at that time. Harini es marayich. Show me your appearance. Show me how you look. Show me what you look like. What is that? As kishron peulasech. Show me the fitness, the rightness of your actions. Show me the quality of your deeds at this time. That's the appearance of Israel. What we show to God is our upright, fitting, suitable, righteous acts. Lami at pona tsara. To whom do you turn at a time of trouble? So in other words, what is the act that he was asking for. He says to her, Harini Asmaraich, show me your appearance. Show me what you look like, your deeds, your righteous deeds. Show them to me. 
What is the righteous deed that God was looking for? Show me it who, to whom it is that you turn in a time of trouble. It's a time of trouble. There's something you can, you can do. What there's nothing you can do, you can't go, you can't turn back. And you can't turn forwards and you can't turn right and you can't turn left. Where can you turn? To whom can you turn? There is only one place, if you will, where they can turn. And obviously that is to God. And when Israel turns to God, and this is not a physical turning. This is not an external turning. This is obviously turning inwards, right? We can't turn forward, turn backward, turn right or turn left. There's no external turning we can do. We turn in. And that is described here as an, an act, an act of turning. When we pray, we are moving in a spiritual sense. So show me your actions, the actions of turning towards me when you are in a time of need. Hashmi'ini es let me hear your voice. Fits right in. Says Rashi, just a quote straight out of the book of Exodus. Vayitzaku v'nei Yisrael el Hashem. And the children of Israel cried out to Hashem at the sea. This is in Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. Let's examine the verse. I have quoted it here below in this pinkish text here. Can everybody see that okay? Any confirmation? Visible. Yeah, visible. visible. Okay. So here's the verse. Ufaro <laughs> hikriv. Pharaoh drew close. And there's a beautiful vart here from the Shla. A beautiful word the Shla says on this that I'm, I'll share with you after. And Pharaoh approached. Vayesu v'nei Yisrael nehem. The children of Israel lifted up their eyes. That that Now the question is, they lift their, up their eyes to whom, right? So from the context, it seems this is a physical seeing because the following words are, mm-hmm. And behold, Egypt was traveling after them, traveling behind them. So the simple interpretation is they lifted up their eyes and saw the Egyptians, you know, they're maybe looking at their feet or something, right? You know, maybe I'm not saying I saw uh, an interpretation like this, but maybe if we're creative, we could say that to lift up their eyes, maybe it means lifting up their eyes heavenward towards God. And perhaps this is the turning. Perhaps this is the turning that is being referred to by, by Rashi. And this is the harini esmar ayich, show me your appearance, which is a word related to seeing. Lir oth, lir oth is to see. So, Show me how it is that you see, perhaps. And here they lifted up their eyes towards God. Again, it's that you don't physically see God, but it's a lifting up in a spiritual sense. Perhaps that's a little bit of creative license by me. Not necessarily does that have to be the meaning here, even if it just means they saw the Egyptians. Okay, and the Egyptians were traveling after them, and they feared Greatly, and they cried out to Hashem. Meaning, if we look at the context, we see exactly precisely when the Egyptians were traveling behind them and drawing close, and they had nowhere to go, and they saw the Egyptians coming, and they were afraid, and they had the sea on one side, and the Egyptians on the other. What did they do? They cried out to Hashem. Let me hear your voice. Here's their voice. Now, I want to, Take a look at Rashi's comments on that verse because I find them very interesting. Rashi says on the word Vayitzaku, and they cried out. He, this is gorgeous. This is gorgeous. He says, Tafsu umnus avosam. They grabbed a hold onto umnus avosam means the craft of their fathers. Like you have a craftsman, a guildsman. He has a certain skill. And this is like his area you know you have your your glass blowers and your artisans and your carpenters and you know each per you have your electricians and your architects each person has his umnus he has his craft he has his specialty thing that he's talent that he is 
you know, tops in. That's what he does his career. What is the career of the Jewish person as Rabbi Victor Miller, whom we spoke about last week, he would always talk about, you know, a Jew has is like a career of serving Hashem. It's, his, it's the Jew career, it's service of Hashem. So here they, they grabbed onto the umnus, the guild, the craft, the, that special skill of their forefathers, which was prayer. By Avraham, by Avraham, we find, and here Rashi will give examples of where we find that each of the forefathers, whom we're reading about now in the, in the Parshas of the week, uh, each of the forefathers prayed to God. This was their, their special craft, prayer. So now the Jews grabbed hold of it. And, and maybe that's another meaning here of show me your appearance. Show me who you are. I, I know you. I know you're the children of Israel. You you have a you 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 come with a certain form that has been passed on to you from your forebearers. I saw it in their time. Show me, show me that you are that same nation. Now I'm going to make it even better, perhaps than I just did. If that wasn't cool enough for you, but um, as some of you may remember. Or, or perhaps none of you, but in the very first Shir Hashem class, class number one, I'm going to rewind now to the top of my top of my Google Doc, okay, which is presently 30 pages long. But if I zip up to the top, the very first paragraph here, uh, what what's titled the Hakdoma, the introduction, is Rashi's introduction to Shir Hashem. I don't know if anyone saw that class. But Rashi talks about the relationship between the woman and the man in Shir Shir, and that she's alone, and this is a memoir. She's thinking, she's reminiscing of these, these good memories they had together. All of Shir Shir is a memoir. Remember that time? Remember that time? Remember that time? Wasn't that nice? So this also what we're reading now, the, the, the episode at the sea, was a beautiful expression of the relationship that she's remembering while she's alone in exile. She's separated from her beloved, and she's reminiscing with sadness to the good times that were, introspecting, repenting, and hoping for the future of being reunited. That's the introduction to the book. So he says that when he talks about she's thinking about him and he's thinking about her, Rashi says, Af doda tsarlo bitsarasa. And that's a theme we talked about in class number 12 and we revisited multiple times. Even her beloved, Tsarlo Bitsarasa, he feels pain when she feels pain. She's feeling pain right now in her exile that they're separated and she doesn't have that togetherness with him that she yearns for. So she's in pain. You know what? Her pain pains him as well. Umazkir, and what does he remember? Chasde Neureha, the kindness of her youth. We spoke about this, that the kindness of the Jewish people having emerged from Egypt on faith listening to Moshe and Aaron to go out into a desert, a wilderness, a place of no water, no food, no provisions, and trusting and believing that Hashem would care for them. That was the chesed that she showed, sort of an unwarranted act of benevolence, if you will, towards God, that he remembers their chesed. That's how Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah the prophet, expresses it in chapter 2 of Jeremiah. Zachar tiloch chesed neurayich. I've remembered for you the kindness of your youth, ahavas kilulosayich, the love of your days of brideship. So even Jeremiah is hearkening to this imagery of the of the bride and groom in the emergence from Egypt. Lechtech acharai b'midbar be'eretz los ruah that you followed after me in the desert in a place that was not sown. So God remembers that, and what else does He remember? Vinoy yofya. The beauty of her appearance, which it seems like we are encountering, the chishron pa'aleha, and the fitness, the rightness, the uprightness of her acts, which is Rashi's language here. Har inias marayach, show me your appearance. What's your appearance, says Rashi? Kishron pe'ulosayach. I'll check the exact words. Well, I've lost the place already here. 
Kishon Pulasech. The fitness of your acts. That's the same language he says in the introduction. These are the things that God remembers about her that he. So there's a few things. There's there's uh, the the kindness of her youth. There's her the beauty of her appearance. There's the rightness of her acts. And here it's like also in a certain way, we're seeing echoes of all three things happening here. Because although it's not quite the kindness of her youth, but we do have the acts of the fathers. We have the the memory of that older time, that previous time of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, that, that she's hearkening to now by praying. And that's what he's asking her to do. Grab hold of those acts of your forefathers. So it's sort of also a memory of times past, of good times past, that is awakening within God his love the beauty of the appearance through their righteous acts, which is here, the turning inwards or turning upwards, heavenwards in prayer, crying out to God when they're in a time of need. And that basically brings us to verse 15. Any questions? Okay, I assume that means everything's crystal clear. And we're ready to go. Okay, let's go on. Stop me at any time. Verse 15, chapter 2, verse 15. Echazulanu shu alim, shu alim ketanim, mechabilim kiramim, uchramenu semodar. Which means, Echazulanu shu alim, grab hold for us, Echazulanu. Grab a hold for us, shu'alim. Does anyone know what a shu'al is? A shu'al in Hebrew is a fox. Grab hold for us, foxes. Shu'alim kitanim, mechabilim kiramim. Shu'alim kitanim, small foxes, mechabilim kiramim, that destroy the vineyards. Grab hold for us, foxes. Small foxes that destroy vineyards. Uchramenu simadar. And our vineyard is unripe. You'll remember the word smodar from the last couple of classes. Smodar is the unripe grapes, the unripe vine. Grab for us foxes. Small foxes that are destroying the vineyards. And our vineyards are unripe. What does this mean? Any thoughts before we go ahead with the commentary? Okay. Listen to this. Listen to this. Echazulanu Sholim, grab hold for us foxes. What's going on over here? Shama Hakadish Baruchu Eskolam. The Holy One, blessed is He, heard their voice. Siva Es Hayom. So God commanded the sea, Ushtafam, and the sea wiped them out, flooded them out. Flooded the Egyptians out. He heard their outcry. He said, See, ocean, get them. That's what was done. That's the verse of grab hold for us, foxes. The God commanded the sea, Hey guys. And you might remember back from chapter one when we first encountered the splitting of the sea. And remember, then later Rashi said, okay, you know, we got the main idea. Now we're going back. We're revisiting in a flashback these events. So now we're getting a second visit with a second layer of meaning. So he says, so you, so anyway, you remember from chapter one, the Susim. If you remember, the horses of God, the chariots of God in the water, that there were these watery, angelic, spiritual message ministers of God that charged through the sea to wash away Pharaoh's army. I don't know if you remember this. It's just a very awesome visual for me. So uh, it was God's chariots versus Pharaoh's chariots. The, 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 the angels chariots in the sea, these watery angels, whoosh, Washing away, flooding away Pharaoh's army. So here we're, we're, we're coming at it from another angle where God is commanding them. Hey, guys, you, my chariots in the sea, 
grab the foxes. Grab them, get them, chops them, as they say in Williamsburg. You know, if there's a there's a someone up to no good in Williamsburg who comes and tries to attack a Jewish person there, so they they yell, chops them, chops them, grab them, grab them. All of a sudden, you know, these big burly Hasidim jump out from behind the shadows, beat the guy up. You know, I don't come back here again. You know, the Shomrim, they have uh, you know these kind of neighborhood watches. So uh, if you ever heard of chops them, so that's. What's echazulan ushualim chapsum? God says. So let's let's see further. What is foxes? What is small foxes? What's the vineyard? Very fascinating. So zehu, this is the meaning of echazulanu hashualim halalu. Grab for us these foxes. Haktanim im hagdolim. Haktanim im hagdolim. You halal, right? Haktanim im hagdolim. Grab the foxes, the little ones. With the big ones, what does that mean? She'af haktanem hayu mechablim es hakramim, because even the young foxes, the little foxes, they were destroying the vineyards. Ba'od kramenu smadar, while our vineyards were yet unripe. She'anovim dakim, the the grapes are still small and delicate. What is this referring to? You might have heard this before. Stop me if you heard this before. When a Jewish woman would give birth to a male child in Egypt, she would hide him. The Egyptians would enter the houses. And they would search for the male children. But the baby was hidden. And the baby was a year or two years old. Now, I just want to stop there. If that didn't ruffle your eyebrows, um, there's a very mysterious phrase in Rashi that he decides to throw in there. And I don't know why. And I would love if anyone here could help me with this. That the child that was hidden was a year or two years old. Really? How is that possible? In other words, when the baby was born, isn't that what he just said? They would hide it when he was born. So he wasn't a year or two years old. Did they hide the babies for a year or two years? I'll prove to you it wasn't that way. So what does it mean that the baby was hidden but and he was a year or two years old? I, I don't know. Let's see the whole thing and let's circle back. Okay, but I just want to point out that's weird. It's weird. Okay. Vehain mevin tinokos me base mitzri. But they, the Egyptians, would bring... Children. Now I know in modern Hebrew, Tinok means baby, and we think of like an infant. And Rashi here says a, a year or two years. So it's already not a newborn, right? But the word Tinok in rabbinic Hebrew and called classical Hebrew could refer to a much broader range of childhood. You know, even though much more mature child will be called a Tinok, like you might have heard the phrase Tinokos shall base Rabon. The Tinokos, the babies, if you will, of the base rabban, of the house of, of the rabbi, of base rabbi, or the house of the, 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 the rabbinic teacher. It means school children. School children were called tinokos shall base rabban, the babies of the house of the rabbi. These weren't babies, school children, they're learning chomish, right? So tinoko, tinok is a very broad phrase. So when it says they brought the Egyptian tinok, doesn't have to mean they brought an Egyptian baby. An Egyptian child, okay? And we're going to see why it was more than a baby. Vitinok mitzri medaber. And the Egyptian baby would speak. Vitinok Yisrael onehu mimakum shetamun sham. And the Jewish child, the Israelite child, would answer him from his hiding place. It's like they would they would have the sneaky thing where they would have a kid come in and say, hey, is anybody here? I'm just a kid, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, you want to come out and play? Really sneaky stuff, sinister stuff to try to get a, an innocent child to be at ease and then answer, yeah, I'm in here. Can you help me? Can you find me? You know, and so they would have a, an Egyptian child speak and the Jewish child would be lulled into answering him. They would grab him and throw him into the Nile. 
Dun, 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 dun. The Lama Kara Osam Shu Alim. Why were they called foxes? So I can answer already. They were pretty cunning, right? Sounds like a fox. Rashi says an interesting thing. I found it in a medrash. I'm not, I'm not so clear what I'm meant to get out of it, but it says, Ma hashual hazem ma bit lifnos achor of livroach, just as the fox looks behind him in order to run away. Af mitzrim ma bitim achorem. The Egyptians too looked behind them. As it says, Shanamar, as it says in the verse, Anusa mi Yisrael. Let us flee from before the children of Israel. This is in the sea already. When the disasters were happening in the sea and the horses were dragging them and the, the, the wheels got stuck in the mud and the chariots were pulled ahead by the horses and the wheels were, were ripped off of the chariots and the chariots are bumping and thumping along the floor of the sea. Bada, 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 bada. And the Egyptians are getting thrashed to and fro and their bones are breaking and their limbs are popping out of their sockets. These descriptions are to some degree in the Chumash and to a greater degree in the Midrashic literature. So they're like, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. But it was too late, right? So they, the, the Shualim, they look behind them to run away. And the Egyptians also look behind, let's go back. Let's go back that, that way to safety. Okay, I don't know. This is sp specific behavior to a fox. Does anyone know in zoology that the, this, this is so specific, this behavior to a fox, to the point that it says, you know, uh, the foxes, uh, they, they're called foxes because of this. Because of this, they're called foxes. I don't know. I'm just reading what it says. Okay. Um, and then the last thing Rashi says here, Shualim Kitanim, uh, the small foxes, Rashi points out that it's written without a vav. The word shu'al, if you know Hebrew spelling, shu'al, the u sound, would normally be written as the letter vav with a little dot in the middle, which is the u vowel. Now, of course, in a scroll, we wouldn't have the dots, but we would still have the letter vav there, which would indicate the u sound. So, but here, without vowels, you wouldn't know there's an U there. We just have an oral tradition that this word is read shu alim, though without a vowel, it looks like it would be read sha alim. And sha alim is something. And so Rashi says the vav was left out on purpose to hint to the word sha alim. What are sha alim? Says Rashi, the reason the vav was left out was because they were punished with water. And what does it say about water? It says about water that shenimdudu v'sha'alo shel makom, that the waters were measured with the sha'al of Hashem. Hashem measured the waters with his sha'al. So sha'al goes together with water. Where is that? Just to point it out, it's, it's in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, 40 verse 12, where it says, mi modad v'sha'alo mayim. Who measured in his Sha'al water? And it's a praise of God that he's so powerful and he's so great that he, he has the implements and the tools to measure enormous structures that a human being cannot measure. God can measure the seas with his Sha'al, which is some type of a measuring implement. And the Shomayim Bezeres Tiken, and he, he fixed the heavens with a Zeres. Zeres is like a half of an ama, but whatever, like it refers to, you know, a certain measure and, uh, and so on and so forth. He, he measures the dust of the earth and he measures the mountains and the hills, etc. So in speaking of how God measures the earth, it speaks of his Sha'al measuring the water. So here that the Egyptians would be drowned or punished or judged with water so that's another reason why they're depicted as a creature that is spelled the same way as the measure of water, because the Egyptians were punished measure for measure. So the measure of water, which is a sha'al, is the depiction of the Egyptian who was meted out, and you could see meted out from the words uh, uh, mi modad, modad b'sha'alo mayim. It, it was meted out to them punishment with the 
measuring stick of the water. Okay. Now I read you a lot and I didn't pause very much for elaboration, but now that we got to the end, any comments or questions? And, and I, I really do want to elaborate here because um, there's so much. Really, you could say anything. Mysterious stuff. Mysterious stuff. Not, not totally comprehensible. But, I mean, if we were to just gloss over it really quickly, we would say, okay, grab the foxes, the foxes, the Egyptians, the small ones, because they, because they, um, the small ones, because they were complicit in the, in the, in the extermination of the Jewish males. Right, they were they were destroying the vineyards while the vineyards were unripe. Meaning the young, they were destroying the young in their very youthful stage. So they got punished. No questions on this. Here is the major question. I really have ho hope we have time to really flesh this out. This is a killer question. I think. The small Egyptians that killed, that were complicit in killing the drowning, the Jewish baby boys were at the splitting of the sea. I know I'm, st I'm looking at you like, like I'm expecting something from you. But in other words, it sounds like they were chipped. Here's what it sounds like. It sounds like there were children at the splitting of the sea. Like the Egyptians brought their children with them. Is that come? Let's go and see the annihilation of the Jews. It's going to be great. Come on, kids. Let's go for the spectacle. Now, now that I'm saying it, 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 it doesn't sound so ridiculous after all, to be fully honest, right? In other words, in other words, you could totally hear the depravity of the Egyptians that they were so convinced that they were going to rout the Jews at the sea that, and they were so sick that they wanted to educate their children in this way that let me show you what being an Egyptian is all about. Let me, let me, this is part of your upbringing. Your, your, I have to show you what an Egyptian does. Hashem saying to the Jews, show me who you are. Show me what you look like. Show me what a Jew does. A Jew turns to God, a Jew cries out. The Egyptians are doing the exact same thing on the other side. They're turning to their children and say, let me show you what an Egyptian does. Let me show you what we're all about. Come to the sea and let's, let me educate you on how we kill Jews. Is, is that so far from believability? I want to know your honest answer. Rabbi. Um, now that you brought all this more vivid uh, image, it made me think because by then, all the firstborn of Egypt would have been killed. The firstborn yeah. of Egypt would have been killed. Okay, okay. It's a good point. Uh, a lot of the Egyptian children were dead, but not certainly yeah, not all of them. Yeah, so then they... That did not make them fear Hashem at all, right? Or, or it was very because, temporary. It was very, te meaning yeah. they said to the Jews, get out, get out, get out. You know, they yeah. said to Pharaoh, but what are you crazy keeping them here? Send them away, right? Yeah. Uh, how come they even take their own child, the, the ones that they have left with them? You know, they should have at least kept them in Egypt secure. When they went after their, their right, so for sure, for sure, there was a certain irrational enthusiasm with, with to even pursue the Jews again. And we, I think, back in like class number six, we spoke about this: how Pharaoh had to coax everybody to come, and he promised them great riches, and he opened up his treasure houses, and he had everybody come and take treasures. I don't know if you remember that class. I know Shira that you you went through the series. So um, somehow 
Fiero was able to get everybody out of this sense of shock and fear of the Jews to go and pursue. I mean, they, they did it, right? They came, they pursued, they ran into the sea. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I don't think it's out of the realm of believability that they might've brought their children with them because I'll tell you why. First of all, you think the Nazis, Yamach Shalom, and a lot of what Rashi is describing mm-hmm. here and the way they entered the homes and searched for hidden children and mm-hmm. killed them mercilessly, a lot of that is very evocative of recent history. I mean, it's incredible that Rashi could write such a description and we could say like, we know all about it. We know all about it, right? It's very so, very reminiscent. Very reminiscent. Very and reminiscent. Very reminiscent. We, we, unrealistic. I mean, right. it, it just, it, it's fascinating to me as I'm, as I'm listening to this and hearing this, um, just how similar it is to how Nazis behaved. But the other thing is that there's a kind of a revealing of evil. evil. I, and I don't know where this is you know, where this is revealed, but my sense, and it's just a sense, I can't point to Psukim, but my sense is that before God punishes, he always lets rise to the surface the evil that merited the punishment so that it's clear for all to see. It's clear. Um, It's been, it's been laid bare. Um, And and we see this in this in the story of the Exodus generally is that the process is to clarify both for people who may have been directly and actively complicit in the evil of Egypt and the people who were really thoroughly complicit in it um, and dedicated to it. There's just something, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? There, there's something very uh, clarifying about the process by which the Egyptians are bought to the point of self destruction or of destruction. Um, and and I, I think, you know, generally throughout history, one could take the position or the perspective that, um, that God allows things to get very, very bad. And the question is why? why? Why does it become darkest before the dawn? Why is it that, that the evil reaches a fever pitch before it is finally addressed? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but I have a pretty firm belief that that's how, how, it, how it happens, that we, we, we get to a point where we, there's an education going on, right? God just doesn't come in and punish people for being evil, right? He, he obviously he forbears. He says the iniquity of the Amorite is in full. You know, there's all sorts of things where you know the people of Nineveh are given a second. We're always given, you know, any any evildoers are given chance after chance. But the people of Israel were given that before the exiles, right? We're always given a chance. But the real purpose of all of that, that common theme, is that it's very important for people to see the evil they're engaging in, either passively, through ignorance, or actively, it's very important for that to be laid bare as a pre, you know, as a, as a prerequisite, so to speak, for the final act of judgment. Um, so I don't know how pertinent it is to this particular situation, but in a way, it is pertinent because we're talking about, well, let's understand exactly what was the essential nature of Egypt, you know, this feeling that winners you know, that winning is everything, this feeling that, uh, you know, uh, you know, this, this, it, it, you know, what it reminds me of very, very much is I can't help but think that what we're really seeing here is the same kind of attitude and the same kind of mentality of people who would go to the games in Rome, right, that would go to the Colosseum in Rome, and they would take great joy in watching these prisoners being torn apart by animals. It was a, it was a, it was a, uh, what's the word for it? It was an entertainment. It was something light. It was a celebration of domination. It was all of those things. And that is essentially part of the essential evil. You know, Parashi here, it's the essential evil of the Egyptians, right? They were guilty of that. It really, complete hubris is what they were guilty of at, at its root. But anyway, maybe, maybe there's something to that. I, I'm thinking that it's important for us to understand 
the, the, the resident evil of, of the Egyptian society and culture in order for us to accept and properly contextualize ultimately the punishment that is visited upon them. Right, and, 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 and I don't know if we are fully realizing the evil of Egypt, except maybe through these descriptions. Mm-hmm. Some of the things that Rashi's saying is sort of bringing it out, like just how uh, depraved they were. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and all we could really think about as a modern day analogy is, is Nazi Germany. And, and, um, and you said so much, Cliff, and, and really brilliant stuff. And, um, you know, I, 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 w- I would like to respond to some of the things that you're saying, but, but I also don't want to go too far afield from the, from the material. Sure. So I might, I might leave, I might leave it as you stated it, but, um, as far as the depravity of Egypt, um, we, we get this description and, and we, we can imagine how in Germany, I don't know how much imagination is required that they, they taught this to their kids, you know, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, that a Jew is, is, is deserving of death. You know, you think they were hiding it from their children? You know, it was uh, as, as um, a teacher of mine said, it was given with the mother's milk. Mm-hmm. And here, he, he, you know, so you could, you could, I'm, I'm saying it's within believability that they did bring children. Look today at what's going on in radicalized a- areas like um, the Palestinian territories, where you have children being brought to violent protests and children being dressed up with, with explosive belts. And the children have these training camps, the summer camps where they, they train in like guerrilla warfare and targeting Jews. And they have these chants and songs and you have the, all the footage on memory. Just go to memory.org, M-E-M-R-I.org, Middle East uh, Muslim Research in- Institute, something like that. And they have all these video clips of um, very disturbing th- things that are being taught. And you have uh, schools in the United States. There was a there was a whole controversy that one of these like uh, Muslim centers published a video of like a kids play where it was like kill the Jews, kill the Jews, kill the Jews in in Pennsylvania somewhere. And you know it got publicized around and and it was quickly taken down. And and the, the people who run the center, oh, we never authorized. We don't know anything about this. Oh, we don't know who made this this production, and we don't uh, we don't sanction it. And we took the video down. We condemn it completely. Okay, maybe maybe that's so. But somebody put that together, right? You definitely have radical elements of many populations. I'm not singling anybody out, and I'm not saying anything is is endemic or intrinsic to any any group. But it certainly exists cultures, mini cultures, or or or, or larger cultures of hatred towards whomever very often towards Jews, not always could be towards others, but you could, you could very much see how the children could be there at the sea where the Egyptians were so certain they were going to have a victory and it ended up get the kids too. Yeah. Right? I could easily imagine it. And the, you know, Chapsim, the kids too, maybe we should float them off to safety. No. Now why not? Oh, cause they're also complicit. Now don't tell me, that the kids at the sea were complicit in the, the, the boys being thrown into the river because that's totally anachronistic because the boys being thrown into river was when Moshe was born. Moshe was born 80 years prior, right? Mm-hmm. Now, you, you, you're going to say maybe it was going on for all 80 years. No, what it wasn't. It wasn't, to my knowledge anyway. And, and I'll, I'll have to go quick because we have five minutes left. But just... Um, when Moshe was born, Rashi explains this in the Chumash. Well, you know, we see these interesting passages where Pharaoh says to the, to the midwives, kill the males, let the females live. Why, you know, if you're so worried about population growth, why is it okay the females live and not, and not the males, right? And we could have answers for that. But Rashi says that there was a, um, there was a, like a prophecy or a, his stargazers, Pharaoh stargazers said that, there was going to be a savior of Israel that was going to be born and it was going to be a male. And Pharaoh said, we got to make sure this savior never lives 
to see beyond this birth. And mm -hmm. that's, that's why I said all the males have to die. And then later, Moshe ends up being born. And, uh, you know, we know that the, the midwife was actually Moshe's mom and she didn't listen. Moshe ends up being born. We spoke a couple of weeks ago how the Levites were not enslaved, yet they were not exempted from the degree of the execution of the males. This was not something that was related to the slavery. It was related to Pharaoh's stargazers telling him there was going to be someone who was going to overthrow him. And so get this. So when Pharaoh decrees that the boys be thrown in the river, it says, Pharaoh said, um, what does it say? Uh, do I have, did I put it in the notes? I don't know if I put it in the notes. I didn't put it in the notes, but Pharaoh says, it says that he, he commands le amo, le amo to his nation. But when he says about the boys, the, the, the midwives uh, killing the boys, I think it says, he says el amo to his nation. And then, um, but here it says le amo. And Rashi says, what's the difference between el and le? Le being a prefix that is usually translated as two, but could also be translated as four. Whereas el is always translated as two. El amo, to his nation. Le amo could mean to his nation, but it also could mean for his nation. Mm -hmm. And Rashi's consistent opinion throughout the Torah, this is not specific to this place, consistently says in the Torah, unlike contemporary Hebrew to his time, where Lamed could be a prefix meaning two, in the Torah, it only means four. Mm. So whenever you see Le, it means regarding. So when it says Pharaoh said Le Amo, regarding his nation, every male that's born, throw him into the Nile. So it means he commanded that the Egyptians be throwing their boys into the Nile also. Which is mm. very interesting. And the reason for that was because the stargazer said on the day Moshe was born, we see he was born like they were trying to avoid it happening, right? That was beforehand. And then they thought he was going to be a Jew because it says there's going to be a boy who's going to save the Jews. They assumed it was going to be a Jew. But when he was born, they said he's born. They're looking at the stars, the stargazer. They said, we see that he's been born, but we cannot tell whether he's a Jew or not because we see signs of Jewishness and we also see signs of Egyptianness. They didn't realize that he was going to be raised by Pharaoh, very ironically. And that's why in their stargazing technique, they saw Egyptianness in the child. There's signs of him being an Egyptian because he was raised Egyptian. So Pharaoh's like, then all the boys have to die. The Jews and the Egyptian boys have to die. Nobody was exempt from this. And um, when Moshe was put into the water, so just a little bit more. The, the stargazer said, we see that his weakness is water. His downfall shall come through water. Hmm. The downfall of this child shall be through water. That's why he said the river. Because why, why throw them in the river? Why not just chop their heads off? Why throw them in the river? They said, the, he, we can see that his downfall shall be through water. And we know Moshe's downfall ultimately was when he hit the rock to make the water come out and he should have perhaps spoken to it or whatever the correct interpretation is there. But his downfall was through water. It was the incident of the water and the rock. So they said, we see his downfalls through water. That we can see in the future. So Pharaoh says, throw him into the water. So they're throwing everybody in the water. I'm like, is he dead yet? No, he's not in the water yet. You know, what do you see now? Throw some more babies in. Is he in the water yet? No, he's not in the water yet. And then Yocheved puts the baby in the teva. She puts him in the river and says, uh, you know, safe sails, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, the stargazers are looking and they go, oh, 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 we, we got him. We got him. He's in the water. He's in the water. Woo, we got him. He's in the water. And they're all having a party. He's in the water. We got him. And they said, call off the executions. Mm -hmm. We're safe. He's been drowned. So then, then later on, you know, uh, Pharaoh's daughter comes home. You know, I found a little baby. Eh, it's okay. I got the one I was looking for. <laughs> God's great. Anyway, so um, 
I, I, I have so much to say on this. It's unfortunate, but I, I don't know if you could give me a few minute, few minutes, but here's the thing. So my, here's my point. The babies that stopped. And that's why it's funny that Rashi says the children were a year or two years old. They weren't hiding for that long. Meaning Moshe from the time he was born till the time he was put in the water was three months. So three months max, you know what I mean? Like it's mysterious to me. I don't have a full answer for that. We could think about it. But I think one of my other major questions is what do you mean the children, the small ones, the small ones who were complicit in killing the Jews? Well, those kids are 80 years old now or more, right? So they were they at the sea, right? And can you call them small? So again, because we're out of time, here's my, I hope you're the question. They're killing the babies at the sea who were complicit in, 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 in killing the Jews. It's 80 years later. It's 80 years later. They're not babies anymore. I don't know if they're at the sea, but it could be A, maybe they were at the sea. Maybe the old men also came. Maybe the children and the old men came. But it could be this is the meaning. Haktanim and Magdolim, the ones that were at the sea were the, were the grown-ups who, when they were young, were complicit. And even now, when they're older, those kids that did that, they're going to get their comeuppance now. In other words, the Mida Keneged Mida. When you remember when you were younger and you had, you, you, you had Jewish kids thrown in the sea? Well, now you're going in, Right. And God arranged that those people should be there. They were the Ketanim then, but now they were the Gedolim. Okay? So you had Egyptian... Th so I want to say all this could be, that the young kids who were actually busy helping Jewish boys be drowned then, who were now old men, were at the sea. The regular soldiers who were grown men currently pursuing the Jews to kill them and were guilty... And deserving of death, we're at the sea. And even the young children now could have been at the sea. Come, let me show you what, what Egyptians are all about, right? Let me educate you, child. Let me show you. And that we could say one of the meanings here is that those children also were considered guilty, like, like the ones who were complicit then, because it's the same thing all over again. What was done then is just going to be repeated now. And that's why, that's why we, how do you kill an innocent child? He doesn't know anybody. Does, his parents made him do it. He put his brainwash. What, what are you killing an innocent child for? So I think because we could see generationally, it's true. Now he's a child and you could excuse his actions, but look what he's going to be. Look what his father's doing. His grandfather's here too. His, his grandpappy's here at the sea. And look what he, look what he turned out to be. When you start off this way and when you grow up in the Egyptian society and you have that type of upbringing, this is where you're going to end up and we're going to stop it at its root. So the children, the old men, all, I want to say three generations at least were at the sea. Young children, adult soldiers, and even the old men who were the children back then came to see the demise of the Jewish people. And I, I want to say, I, I don't know, that, that I thought of, I thought that was very moving to me personally. I want to share one more thing and then I'll, I'll end it. I know it's already past the hour, if you can bear with me. So I, I mentioned this verse that the, the foxes look behind them. So too, the Egyptians look behind them to turn away. They said, let's, let's get out of here, right? So let's look at that verse and Rashi there and we'll call it a night. So the verse is in Exodus chapter 14, verse 25. And it says, Vayosar as Ofan Markivosav, the chariot's wheels came off. Vayinahageu bechvedus, and they were being drawn with uh, heaviness, you know, with a very bumpy ride. Bada, 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 bada. They're being dragged through the, through the dry land and busting up, right? Vayomer Mitzrayim, and Egypt said, Egypt said, Egypt said, let us run away because of the Jews. Because God is fighting for them in Egypt. In Egypt. Now you could say against Egypt. You know, there are different translations, but it's, it's a funny wording. So Rashi says over here, he's fighting for them in Egypt. So Bam it could mean against the Egyptians. That's a simple meaning of in Egypt, with Egypt, against Egypt. Fine, we could translate it that way. 
Dover Achir, here's another meaning. Bimitzrayim. God's fighting in Mitzrayim. Listen to this. Be'eretz Mitzrayim, in the land of Egypt itself. We're in the, out in the desert by the sea, but back in civilization, there's also something happening. Shekeshem she'elu lokim al hayam. Just as these are being struck at the sea, kach lokim osam shenishuru b'mitzrayim. Those who didn't come to the sea and stayed behind in Egypt are also being struck down. As the, the Egyptians were drowning here, people were dying over there also simultaneously. Meaning, whether we literally view it as a generational army of grandparents, parents, and children coming to sort of take care of the final solution of the Jews and it turning on them, even those generations that we wouldn't expect to have been there, the old men who were children in Mitzrayim 80 years ago who were complicit in the, in the killing of the Jews like we have today, old Nazis that still are alive today and they can reminisce about the good old days or the young children that they left behind in Mitzrayim but that they would be raising to be Jew killers, Right? The, those generations that remained in Egypt while the strong army-aged men went out, they were still dying over there. So with that Rashi and Chumash, and we come back over here to Shira Shirim, where it says, Shualim Kitanim, get the small ones. Rashi says, Kitanim imagadolim. Get the small ones with the big ones because they were complicit in everything we read. It doesn't mean that those children were still children now or that they were present now but whether they were old men now and we're getting them back or we're talking about children who will be raised similarly to the way egyptians raised their children which is to kill jews as we had those examples 80 years earlier they were all dying now anyway whether in the sea or back in egypt they were all at this point punished and here we'll pause the class thank you rabbi Okay, please forgive me for going over time. Any questions? Now open q and I, I probably have to go, but, you know, it's amazing when you mentioned, you know, there's another parallel with Nazi Germany, which is that when Pharaoh um, authorized the killing of Egyptians by water, because he, you know, the, he saw a threat to himself, that's somewhat analogous to what Hitler did when he was in his bunker in the last days of the war, um, where a lot of the residents of Berlin had, uh, German residents of Berlin, uh, of Berlin had taken refuge in the sewers. And they were living down there because of the bombing, the almost constant bombing. And the sewers were actually a, a way that the, I, I guess the Russians were beginning to um, become closer and closer to the main bunker where Hitler was. And Hitler issued an order to uh, flood those sewers, to flood those. those wow. Uh, wow. And so essentially there's, there's pretty much an analogy going on, I think, where he was willing, and he was told by his, his uh, you know, the people that were around him at the time, you can't do that. You're gonna wipe out, you know, uh, loyal, loyal Germans, you know, people who are, are your countrymen. And he said, go and do it anyway. Destroy them anyway. We're fighting for national socialism, he said. And that's apparently what he said. So when it came to his own survival or just staving off his own destruction for even a few hours, he was willing to sacrifice his own countrymen by way of water, by way of drowning. Um, so it, 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 it kind of seems to me there's kind of a parallel with what, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, with what Pharaoh was doing. In the end, they only care about themselves, obviously. In the end, it's all about self-preservation and, and, you know. It's a very, it's a very and, eerie power. I didn't know that. He drowned yeah. his own to save himself like Pharaoh. I mean, the parallels, you know, between Egypt and Nazi Germany are uh, very eerie. They're very eerie, as well as the parallels between, you know, the Nazis and, and, and Haman and that story of Purim. A lot of very eerie parallels, but we shouldn't be surprised by any of this because this is all sort of divinely orchestrated and part of a pattern of yeah. one unified history. So it, it's just like a confirmation of what we already know to be the reality. Absolutely. And, you know, they never did it. 
by the way, his, his underlings refused to do it. They never carried out his order, um, which, you know, obviously, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about that, but, but they never carried out the order because they knew that it was over. Um, he was the only one still giving orders of that sort. But anyway, yeah, well, anyway, thank you so much for this lesson. Yeah, thank you for that insight. Thank you for joining this evening. Sure. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Okay, so I appreciate everyone's attendance. Uh, if you didn't already, please jot your name in the chat. So I have a record of the attendance and hopefully God willing, We'll see you again in a week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Bye, Bye.